and welcome to Juicy Scoop. Wow, I am so excited for you guys to hear the interview I have today with Rachel Uchitel. She has led such an interesting life in predominantly New York City, but she's gone from 9-11 tragedy to dating Tiger Woods to opening up Tao Las Vegas to dating some people that even I was shocked to hear that she had dated led such an interesting life, such an interesting story. I'm really excited for you guys to listen to it and get to know her. Also, I want to thank everyone who's listened to and watched, not listened, but watched my stand-up special on Amazon Prime Video Direct. Please, if you've watched it, go and leave me a review. Tell your friends about it. It is getting a great response, and it means so much to me, and it, it's really going to help lead to more specials like that. So if you like it and you want to see more from me, that has to do really well. So I appreciate your support. Okay, you guys, let's get into The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. It was the season finale, and it happened at Dorit's house where she had a Christmas par- holiday party, mind you. And PK and I are so excited to open our home to our good friends. And this is a photo of them on my YouTube here. Um, they all looked absolutely gorgeous. Again, a lot of wigs. Lisa Renna is wearing wigs. Um, She's wore wigs all season. Kind of interesting. But it looks, I mean, she's gorgeous. It looks great. Uh, Garcelle looked stunning in red. And lots of hair and a fun hairdo came. Kim Richards was there. And Brandy showed up. Um, Sutton wore some Dolce & Gabbana dress that was absolutely horrible. It looked like a doily that you stuck plates to. And I'm sure it cost $12,000, but Sutton, I love you. This is an awful dress. It just did not work. Anyway, Sutton did have something to say to Brandy when Brandy arrived because, um, of course, Denise did not show up. Now, she was supposed to show up. Dorit thought she was going to show up. And Garcelle and her chocolate Michael were waiting in the car for Denise to show up. And uh, she just didn't show up. And therefore, Garcelle missed the magic trick that um, she had like a magician or something uh, Dorit did. But anyway, so instead, Brandy shows up late and they're like, I didn't know that Brandy was going to be coming. So later on, we see that Denise goes and talks to Lisa Renna and they have a sit down that is pretty intense and juicy. Lisa Renna goes, Hello, Denise. Gives her this big, big hug and sit down, my friend. And she goes, well, why didn't you come to Dorit's party? She's like, because I didn't want Brandy to have a Jerry Springer moment. So then it wasn't a family emergency, Denise. Wow. Wow. Aaron said it was a family emergency. We're worried about you. That's a lie. You know, it's really disturbing that my good friend is so comfortable lying about a family emergency when, in fact, she just didn't want to show up to Dorit's party because Brandy was going to be there. Well, of course she didn't. Who the hell would want to show up to the party? And again, I know she got out of filming. You're pissed about that. But do you blame the girl? Like, you know, of course, she knows she's not stupid. She knew Brandy would show up. And then she knew she'd have to be faced with it for the big finale. And you know what? She freaking just would forget it and said, say it's a family emergency. Say I'm sick so I don't have to go to the Capri room opening. Yeah, whatever. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I just don't blame the girl. I, If I was backed into a corner like that on a reality show, I... I just don't blame her. I just think it's like it's in such a mess for her. But I'm so excited for the reunion. But at this, at one point, Sutton and Brandy start to talk. Now, do you remember from the very beginning that when the affair came out between Brandy and Denise, Sutton said, well, I knew. I heard from a very reliable source that had been going on for a while. But you know what? I never thought to share it. It's not my business. Why would I share something like that? It's not ladylike. It's not nice. And... Then she sees Brandy and she goes, well, maybe one day you can learn to not say stuff, okay? Maybe don't say everything that comes to your mind. And Brandy goes, well, that's never going to change. They share, when Sutton came up to her and goes, yeah, we share a facialist or something. So I think that's how Sutton got the word. So I do think Brandy was telling multiple people, not just Kim Richards, not just fellow housewives, 
I think she was sharing it with a lot of people. So, um, of course, it was going to eventually come out. How it came out, you know, to the producers, who knows, maybe from several sources. So I thought that was juicy. Then, um, so anyway, it ends. The, the season ends. I'm so excited for the reunion. It's three parts. It's a Zoom reunion. Betsy has made the dresses for me for the dolls. Um, it is... Look, it looks so juicy. Lisa and Denise just freaking go at it. They talk about cease and desist. I mean, it's going to be good. Okay. Now let's get into Real Housewives of New York. The most shocking thing about this episode, and they still have one more left before the season, is that Hannah Banana, Dorinda's daughter, wore the jacket that matches the horrible pants from the throw pillow, the throw blanket on Roseanne, the classic sitcom's couch. Those pants were so awful on Dorinda, and now the daughter has the jacket. I will say it's a little more fun in a jacket, okay? But to think that they bought a matching set of this at one time, maybe the intention was never to wear it together, but it's pretty horrifying. Um, so they, they go to two, there's two parties that we have for this. The first party is Leah's, Married to the Mom, Bob, 15-year celebration of her selling sweats that say Married to the Mom on them. And Sonia has a great time because she's like, you know, here are some real people here. There's some downtown. There's some hot guys. It's fun. And Ramon is excited to meet some hot guys. And she puts on her her favorite outfit that she's worn a lot. They're, they're skinny, satiny, um, tight rose pants. And she goes and she's like, you know, I'm really excited to meet Leah's mother, Bunny. She's not at all what I expected. I really kind of thought that she'd be like a simple minded, not an interesting person. But actually, she surprised me and she had something to say. Leah's like, what? Was that a compliment? So after she talks to her mother, Elise is there. And Elise is like, Ramona, I want to talk to you. And she goes, no, 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 I'm not going to talk to you. I don't know who you are. Go away. And Elise goes, what? What do you mean you don't know who I am? And then Ramona just took off. She didn't get a drink. She didn't get her, her Ramona Stinger Singer. She left in her rose gold pants and white fur and got the hell out of that downtown Married to the Mob party. And no, I nobody knows, including Elise, because I interviewed her, why Ramona stopped liking Elise. She's like, said to Luann, you know what? I don't like her. She's not a girl's girl. She's manipulative. I don't appreciate her. We don't know why. What did she do? All of a sudden, you know, she didn't even try out for the show. She showed up that night when Ramona had a breakdown of wanting to be held. And then she started to film with them. And then all of a sudden, Ramona didn't want her around anymore. And she stopped being invited to stuff. I'm so confused by that. And I know she doesn't make an appearance at the reunion. So um, then we go to Dorinda's party. It's Dorinda's 55th birthday. She invites John, the dry cleaner, her cleaner, her ex. And um, Lou does a very long speech, and then she sings her happy birthday, and it is amazing. It's, happy birthday to you, Dorinda. Happy birthday. I mean, it was pretty great, and it went on for very long, and I loved every second of it. And um, Dorinda was pretty delightful at her birthday. She got in one altercation with Lou about her phone, but for the most part... She appreciated the toast. She liked the singing. And we have one more episode left before the reunion. So, you guys, now for my very juicy interview that has a lot to do with Real Housewives of New York. So we're going right into it, surprisingly, with my girl, Rachel. I am here with Rachel Yucatel. And I talked yeah. about her the other day because you really became famous Um during the Tiger Woods scandal, you've been on TV shows, you've been in the limelight for a long time, and you've just led a very interesting life. And I've always just been sort of fascinated by you. And I'm just really uh, excited just to get to know more about you today on Juicy Scoop. You look beautiful. Thank you for Thank coming. You. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. So, um, okay, so let's just begin. Like, I, I, I remember that... Unfortunately, now, was it your fiancé or your husband who died in 9-11? It was my fiancé. We had just gotten engaged about three weeks before that, but we had been dating for about three years. And there was just the very famous photo of you just in anguish after the horrible 9-11 on the cover of, 
I can't remember which magazine, which, but it was. Yeah. So the, the Associated Press had run a, a photo of me that um, happened to go on the cover of every single newspaper across the world. Um, but the one that uh, everybody saw really was the cover of the Post. And it was titled New York's Tragic Face, I think. Um, and it's in the Smithsonian now. And um, it's one of those famous um, photos that everybody sort of remembers. And I think why they remember it is because Andy was sort of this all-American guy. He was 32 years old. Um, he was on the 104th floor of the South Tower. And he was, um, you know, uh, sort of that typical all-American guy that you could sort of picture this, this story and everybody wanted to know what happened to him, you know. And um, I, at the time, was at Bellevue Hospital looking for Andy. I had heard that um, maybe they were finding bodies in the rubble and they were moving them to the hospitals. And people at the time, the only thing they knew what to do was go and make these um, missing posters. So I had gone to Kinko's and made up a missing poster of my fiance and I had taken it there. And a bunch of media came up and um, a lot of us were doing interviews saying, this is what he was last wearing. This is what we were doing. This is where he was. This is what our last conversation was. We were talking on the phone, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, please help me find him. And the moment that that shot actually was taken was after all the cameras went off and, um, sort of the media was walking away, but, um, somebody, you know, had just caught this picture of me. And I, I was really strong when I was doing the interview, but, but after the cameras went off, I just remember saying, please help me find him. He's my whole life. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where he is. And it was, it was, sorry. It I was know. Really, You're getting was, emotional. I'm getting emotional. I have like yeah. chills up and down. I guess I remember my friend who lived in New York at the time, a guy friend of mine. I just remember him saying, Heather, you, you don't know how sad it is. There's these missing posters of all these people from their wedding day, from their engagement photos, from their graduate. Like, and he's like, and they're all like just, you know, it's so tragic, but they're also like all really like attractive people. Like it's all these like, you know, up and coming yeah. type of successful people that happen to be working in those buildings. And it's just beyond, you know, and so that's what it's just reminding me of that, too, of what that was like um, the city then and how horrible that was. So yeah. um, unfortunately, he was obviously he perished in 9-11 yeah. and. So then where do you, where did your life go from there? Cause I, this is where I find, I find like, it's interesting to me that there's not more like movies and things about the aftermath of people's lives from nine 11, because I find it so fascinating. Like the things that happened to people and, you know, the marriages that became, that were lost, the, you know, the firefighter stories, all that kind of stuff. And, and yours took a very, interesting turn like here you kind of had this life um you know a, a sort of we've we've seen these girls like you you got engaged at the right age you're beautiful you're marrying this you know this you know successful guy and you know the path of your life looked very clear of what this life was going to be like for you having children you know maybe a summer home this type of thing. And then this right. hits you. And so tell the rest, like what, where did you go from there? So it's interesting because, you know, I, at the time worked at Bloomberg news myself. So I was, you know, a career girl, you know, right. I had aspirations. He had just proposed to me. We had just gotten back from um, a trip to Greece the morning before. Um, and literally my whole future ended that moment to me. I'm like, I saw when that building fell, I watched my fiance die, but I also watched my entire future change. I and where were was you, like, where, I will never be the same. Where were you that morning? I was, I was at work. I, that morning I went into work. I, um, I worked the 5am shift at Bloomberg news. Um, and I was basically covering, um, the story. And when, um, the first tower was hit, um, we were covering it and I spoke to Andy on the phone a few times and he was telling me what he saw in, um, in the tower across from him. And he was telling me, I'll never forget. He was like, I can't imagine how bad it is that people are jumping out of 
the window. So he was watching that happen across the way. And he was saying how many um, papers were flying around and how hard it was to see outside. But at the time, even in the news business, all of us thought it was a, um, a private plane or a small plane. Nobody thought it was terrorism. And um, so, again, to... So at that I time, tell- you, nobody was really worried that somehow his no. building was in jeopardy. No, I wasn't mm-hmm. nervous. So I'm at the assignment desk, you know, yelling out who's calling analysts, who's calling airlines. You know, I'm I'm just doing my job. And that morning, um, you know, we were really just back at work. And, you know, it was uh, the first day that I was meeting my grandmother and my um, maid of honor to try on my dress um, that night. And, you know, it was just no- life is normal. And I remember um, I got up that morning and... Um, Andy and I got up extra early because, again, I went to work at 5 a.m. And uh, we were on uh, European time. We were had just gotten back from Greece. So we both woke up early. And when I came, we had a bathroom in our bedroom and we had a bathroom in the living room. And I used to take the towels and put one on my head, one on my body and one on the floor and step on it. And then I would go into the other bathroom and get ready. Not so I wouldn't wake him up. And when I came out of the second bathroom, he was already sitting on the couch. And um, he said, those were the days when you had the one hour photo. And I had gotten all the photos from Greece done with one hour photo. So he said, hey, I want to bring all the photos in to work today. And I said, okay. So I gave it to him. And I said, you know what? You're going to lose the, um, you're going to lose the uh, negatives. What were they called? The 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 negatives. negatives. Yeah. So I, so I, So I took the negatives from him, but I let him take all the photos. And he said, um, you know, he was watching the weather channel. He said, look at how beautiful today it's going to, is going to be. It looks like the weather in Greece. And so I looked up at the TV and I saw, and I said, oh yeah, it's going to be a beautiful day. And I walked towards the door and he said, come give me a kiss goodbye. And I said, um, I have lipstick on, I'll kiss you later. And that was the last thing I said to him. And, um, and then I left and he ended up calling me at work at about 745 and said, honey, I just wanted to tell you, I love you so much. You put all the towels back in my bathroom. So when I went to take my shower, I didn't have, I had towels and I wasn't completely naked and sopping wet, which he was really proud of me for. Cause I always used to leave him sopping wet with no towels. So that was our like little cute interaction that morning. And then the next time I called him was when I was back in the control room urgently like what are you seeing what you know and we were in work mode and he was telling me what he was seeing so anyways to go back to answering your question how this changed me when the second uh plane hit and hit his tower I immediately knew that it was under him because I I could tell by right then I was in the news business you're smart you get it you you know what's going on and I could tell where everything was and I thought he would go upstairs. Again, I wasn't, I really wasn't nervous. And, and nobody had the um, creativity, I guess the word would be, to think that the buildings well, would fall. I mean, no so one So you thought he saw. could go upstairs and they could like yeah. rescue them via helicopter or some ladder yeah. or something? Okay. So I'm still working. I'm, I'm in the control room. I'm working and I'm just doing what I need to do. And I'm still trying to reach him, but I figured he's trying to get out. And um, long story short is very soon after, within minutes, I watched his tower fall and everyone in the newsroom watched me watch Andy die because he was the one that we were talking to, um, you know, to give us information about what he was seeing. And I remember sort of reaching back to try and find my chair to sit down and I had to sit on the floor and like... It, it was a change in my body where I was no longer a kid. Cause to him, I was a kid. I was like a, I was a kid to him. I was 26 at the time. He was 32. He was this big wall street guy. He was a managing director, but he had a gregarious, amazing personality. He was one of those guys that you wanted to know. I was lucky to be loved by him. I was lucky to be chosen by him. The fact that he proposed to me before he died is the one thing that gives me credibility in life, you know, like it makes me know that I'm lovable, that I deserve love because somebody like him chose me and thank God that he proposed to me before he died instead of just that I was just his girlfriend. Do you know what I mean? Like at least I knew that how much he loved me. And at least I know when he died that he knew how much I loved him. So I felt like I had that, but 
there was something that changed in that moment. I was no longer a little girl. I was, um, I was, I had to protect myself. I, I, I didn't believe in fairy tales anymore. I didn't believe in, um, happily ever after. Yeah. And I mm. always did. And it was, re- and it was really sad. It was really sad. Cause I always believed that, that, that that was possible. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's affected my everyday life to this day. I don't, I don't, um, think about, you know, time changes you and you don't think about it every day, but in every choice I make in every reaction I have in every, um, thing I do, it's always in the back of my head. It's in the pit of my stomach and in every move that I have, it's because of what happened to me. You know, it's, um, it's, it's horrible. So, um, you know, so you obviously, you know, were mourning, you had to have a, you know, memorial for him. What, then where did you go from there? Like, how did you, and did you, you know, like what was the next thing with your career and, and living and everything? So, so I had to take like a month off to sort of, you know, I I was looking for him, you know, everybody Mm -hmm. was sort of looking for a while. And, um, so for a week you're looking and then after a week you're like, no, let's get real here. He's not going to be found. And then, um, about a month later, I went back to work and I just went back to work and I threw myself back into, into work. And I became, you know, I had started on the assignment desk at Bloomberg news. And then I became a field producer and a segment producer. And I loved my job, best job I ever had. And, um, I loved doing that kind of exciting, um, you know, uh, thing of being on the newsroom floor and, um, and well, let me ask you, was, it, was about, it, was it difficult being reporting on news and everything and, and seeing what was going on and then them realizing that it was terrorists and these people and the reaction of the country and us going, um, sending the troops over there, like knowing that it, reporting on people you're where you're like, oh my God, this is an association to the people that killed my husband. Like, how is, how is that well, every day? I'll tell so I'll, I'll tell you the interesting thing about it. Because I was on the cover of the newspaper um, th- two days after September 11th, so many people wanted to know what happened to Andy that I felt like I wasn't going through it alone. So it's not like my fiancé was hit by a bus or, you know, um, just died and just I was mourning it and his family. The world was mourning all these people that died and everything that was going on in America. And they were looking for Andy Everyone in the world was like, what happened to Andy? I want to know. I want to know everything about him. I would get letters every day, phone calls, emails. It was crazy. And so it was so, I had so much support. So I, I didn't feel like I was going through it alone. And so I was able to go back to work and really like feel like I had a huge support system. And I quickly moved, you know, I moved, I had to move out of my apartment that I had with him. His family wasn't very good to me at all. Um, and I think they blamed me for being on the phone with him and keeping him in the building. And, um, oh my God. And they, there was this horrible article that was written saying something like, you know, they, Andy loved me for, for 30 years and only loved her for three years or something. So we love him more. And, you know, like the it family, was a you mean from the contest? Family. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, um, you know, because there was this whole big thing about should fiancés get money? or just wives. And so there was this whole thing that became a whole, um, a, a whole, uh, thing with the government then anyways, doesn't and you matter, did not, but, and you did not receive any money as a fiance. Well, what ended up happening is if the family decided to officially write down that, um, your, the, the person that died had been engaged, then they would get a portion of the family's money. If the family chose to give them a portion of their money. Um, so, uh, but, so there was a whole law that was instilled for that, but like, I don't think girlfriends, you know, girlfriends didn't count. And there was a whole thing about ex-wives and, um, if they had a new wife and it was, it got very complicated. um, complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the red cross was very helpful. I was able to actually, um, find stability in this. I was able to buy an apartment. Um, uh, the red cross gave me, I'm going to get the number wrong, but I want to say about $50,000. I was able to 
um, find enough money to literally go buy an apartment on the Upper West Side and like find some stability in this and like be okay and learn how to be on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I was going to say about looking for Andy, you know, my, I worked for Mike Bloomberg at the time who was running for mayor. Mike Bloomberg came, was so good to me, came to my, to Andy's funeral. Um, you know, let me have the time off, um, was, you know, was, was very good to me. Um, but, um, so from there I stayed at work and I was, I was fine. But a year later when, um, everybody, you know, on every anniversary for September 11th, they play, um, you know, what happened and they still do it every year. I had a little bit of a breakdown and I couldn't watch it. I couldn't cover it. And I felt like everybody was just replaying it, you know, and without any emotion. And that was too hard for me to watch because I couldn't, um, play it without, I couldn't cover it without having the emotion in it. And I had to ask for a leave of absence. So I left for about, um, I think a month and I went down to Brazil and I, um, did a trip by myself and tried to like find myself sort of. And I did, I had like this little epiphany that you have to be in the moment and I couldn't sort of sit around waiting, living life. Like what if Andy was sitting next to me? What if I still had this life? What, you know, it was supposed to happen this way and, and it didn't. Um, so I had this epiphany that, maybe it wasn't supposed to happen the way I thought. And maybe this is my life and I'm supposed to get on with my life and I have to get on with it. So I better like get up, I better rise up and, and live instead of sit around, um, you know, living like I've just been a discount version of myself and, you know, that I'm never going to find anyone again. I'm going to always be alone. I'm going to have this tragedy over my head and I got to go home and I got to, I got to figure my life out. And, um, you know, I used to sit in cars and like taxi cabs in Manhattan and feel like Andy was supposed to be sitting next to me or, you know, just feel very alone. Like people didn't understand. And it made me very angry person. Um, so, uh, I was able to sort of get over that. So then I went back to work at, um, at Bloomberg. And, um, from there I met a guy who I had known from childhood and we sort of had a similar September 11 story and we had a childhood uh, friendship and a romance. And I was, you know, I wanted someone to stick. I wanted to know that someone would be there and I was ready to get married years before. And he, we didn't really have any intimacy there, but he proposed to me. I don't really know why, but we were Wait, best he friends. Proposed so to you I, without, he proposed to you without ever boning? Um, yeah, it was like an awkward bone. Oh. Yeah. Um, and did you think it like would a, get to, uh, did you think it would get better or did you just both never try again? Yeah. No, well, we boned at like a Michael Bolton concert or something weird. And then he proposed to me like there. During the the con- like during the concert? No, no. Like during after the and horns? Then maybe we played the music from the CD. I don't know. The whole, I can't, I tried oh, to But put it wasn't it at the concert. It wasn't at the concert. Definitely not. Okay. No. All right. No, I love Michael Bolton. I wanted to listen okay. to the music. Okay. So who wants to bone during it? So you have the weird bone. You think it's awful, but maybe he didn't think it was awful because he asked you to marry him. And what do you do? Well, you say yes? Yeah. I said yes because he was my best friend. And I was like, uh-huh. I'd rather be married to my best friend than not, you know, uh-huh. than, than be alone. And so I thought that would work. And I had this huge marriage at Cipriani with like 500 people. And I thought, oh, this will cure me. You know, this will take away all this emptiness. This will make me whole. I won't feel so alone. And that didn't work. And so, you know, maybe like eight months into that relationship, I realized we weren't going to have sex. He didn't like my two dogs. He made them sleep in the wait hold on the laundry room did this did you feel like it was um like you were charlotte in sex in the city with the first husband that like remember you couldn't have he had like a weird sexual thing and she's like i guess this is it yes so i was like i guess this is it but no i was like you know i came home and i was like i want i mean it really was this dramatic i was like i want a love story and I deserve to have a love story and you don't want to bone me basically. Yeah. And I want to be boned and I, I want to be loved more than boned really. Right. Yeah. And I want 
I want someone to think I'm the greatest thing ever. And, you know, I, I, I just need to know what that's like. And so I'm going to leave. And he did not get up off the couch to stop, try and stop me. So I knew that I had made the right decision, which is really sad. But I mean, looking um, back, what do you think the thing is, it was with him? Do you think he just wasn't a sexual person? He just didn't have a sex drive, but he like liked you as a partner or what do you think it was? Well, I mean, there are people that probably know who he is that might be listening to this. So I don't want to get into the okay. ins and outs of his problem, yeah. but, um, he, no, I think, you know, when it's not a match, it's not a match. Listen, Got it. I don't know about you, but like, there might be people that would have sex with me that be like, that would say she is the worst in bed. She's like a starfish. She lays there. She's the worst. And then there are people that would be like, holy shit. She rocked my world. That is the best sex I've ever had. Right. So it's like chemistry, but like you never want to be known as the starfish that just lays there. So you kind of want to keep trying so that that person doesn't think you're the worst in bed, but it's right for me. I think it's the a chemistry thing and we were best friends, but to me, it was a very asexual chemistry. Got it. You know? So you guys separate after eight months, you get divorced, and then what? Well, this is a great story because I am very spontaneous, and I love to change my life like this. And I have these, I at the time, I had these two great dogs, and right after September 11th, I had bought a dog like two days later, and his name was Rudy Giuliani, and the other <laughs> dog is Ozzy Osbourne. Okay. So, um, so I went, I left the house and I packed up Rudy Giuliani and Ozzy Osbourne. I went to the Mercedes dealership. I said, I want a car. It has to have the little, the time, it has to have the little button on the top that you could talk to the lady and tell her where you want to go. All-star, on-star. Yes. Yeah, whatever. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> on-star. Um, so, and I said, I'm going to drive across country and I need to be able to talk to someone. And he said, Okay. And I said, to get the license plates on it and everything, I'm going to pick it up on Thursday. So I did. And in the meantime, I had this crazy friend, Hillary, who had gone away for the weekend. And uh, she was living with her boyfriend. She'd gone home to visit her parents. And she came home. And she found a used condom in her bed. So he was clearly cheating on her. Oh. And which was perfect for me because I said, listen, come with me. Wherever I end up, I'll fly you home. I didn't want to go by myself, you know. Right, the drive, yeah. So, She's suicidal and a total mess. And I thought this was just fabulous because now I had a road partner. It was a total Thelma and Louise thing. I'm like, I'm leaving my husband. Let's go. Meanwhile, I had just bought with my husband, Stephen, I had bought this like $4 million. Well, I didn't buy it. He bought it. But, you know, this $4 million house. And we had just moved in. And I was literally, it was like leaving behind everything to get into this car with this crazy girl and my two dogs. Rudy and Ozzy and we're driving to nowhere. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but I felt like this was like the right thing to do. Cause I wanted to go find my love story. And, um, so literally that night I got a phone call. Um, and it was my friend Jason who said, listen, where are you? I said, I just left Steven. I'm in the car driving. He said, well, I'm opening up this club in Las Vegas. And, um, you know, I don't trust anybody. All the girls here are strippers or waitresses. Why don't you drive out here? Your grandparents live out here. Um, you can help me open it, you know, while you're figuring out what you're going to do. Just, just come, just come this way. So I said, okay, great idea. So we hung up. And, and I now how, how old are you then when you go to Vegas? I was 29. Okay. So you go driving to Vegas. Okay. Yeah. So I hit the little on star thing. I said, we're on, we're going to Vegas. So by Wednesday, we pulled into Vegas. I had this, uh, I, I called a guy and I'll never forget. We pulled up. I had a five bedroom house with a pool on a golf course and it was like $2,000 a month. I mean, it was nothing compared to what right. you know, rents were in the city. Hillary's like, I'm not leaving. And I started working that night for the Tau group and the Tau, and the Tau group fast forward ends up opening up. And, you know, it's a long story short, right. but I became known as the first lady of Las Vegas and the number one, um, you know, nightclub host in the world for the number one nightclub in the entire world, which ended up being like just almost like this karate kid 
wax on, wax off type of thing because I learned all these different skills from running my own television show at Bloomberg and doing all these things of doing live shows and dealing with all sorts of people and CEOs of publicly traded companies and trying to get them to break news and being able to deal with those people. And all of a sudden, I'm in the midst of, you know, a, lo- a live door that opens and you're dealing with 5,000 people. But my job was really to deal with the high rollers, the celebrities, the, um, and then manage, be able to manage like literally what goes on and be the owner's right-hand person of the biggest club in the world and make them, you know, between 200,000 a night to sometimes a million dollars a night. It was the best. It was so much fun. I had the best time ever. And so how many years did you stay in Vegas doing that? So I stayed in Vegas for, um, I want to say, three or four years. Uh, Let's see, if I was 26, hold on, if I was 26, 27, 28, maybe I went to Vegas when I was 28. So then I stayed in Vegas for three, three or four years. And so then where do you meet Tiger Woods? Well, I first met Tiger Woods. uh, I was dating Derek Jeter. Oh. And, and, um, Tiger was sleeping over at Derek's house. Okay. And um, so he was the guest in the guest bedroom. And he was just a buddy. And I remember he was smoking. We were opening up Derek's window and he was smoking a cigar out the window or something. And we just became friendly. And um, so that's how I, that's how I originally met him in Manhattan. And then when did it become romantic? Um, well, that stuff I'm, um, I'm not going to get into, Okay, but I, uh, but I'll, but I will say that, um, you know, um, we could talk a little bit around that, but, but I'll, mm-hmm. but I will say that, you know, I, um, you know, I, I met him a couple times in the nightclubs through, um, through other people and he would come in or whatever, um, but um, in in December, um, HBO is now going to be coming out with with a um, a documentary or docu series. And finally, you know, I felt like people have gone so low on me, sort of, or uh, about me over the last ten years um, after all the stuff that had come out about um, the the scandal. Right. That I felt like I at some point you know, I needed to sort of remove the shackles of like what that is like to not have a voice. And I felt like at some point I needed to have a voice of, of, um, what that was like for me, um, and what it's been like for me, because I don't think people really get that. Um, because people like to just throw names around and when the media brands you a certain way, um, and the majority goes with that, um, that's a really hard um, thing because you get branded like that and you get branded like that forever. And that's a really hard way to live your life because I've been stuck under that, under that cloud and under that branding. And I haven't had a chance to get out of that. Um, And there are people that go through scandals like that, that are able to sort of slip out of it. And it's harder for a woman, I think. And um, you know, I deserve my own stand up and cheer moment, you know, like tiger gets to win, awards and, you know, or win his, um, his different tournaments and he gets to come out of things and have mishaps and get up again and people want to cheer for him. But, um, you know, the women don't get that so much, not just with him, but in any scandal. And that's not really fair. And I just felt like I needed to be able to have a voice finally, because it's been a really hard 10 years of having to, um, just sit there and let people, um, in the absence of truth, let people say things about me and also just let people um, talk about me like they know me because they don't. And that's um, a really hurtful um, way to live. And it it hasn't been easy, you know? So um, I decided to, to speak. So, and we're going to hear that side of the story um, when this HBO documentary comes out so that you participated in. Well, that's Mm going to be very juicy and you're right. You know, it's like, When I was just talking, um, you know, about you yesterday, like I didn't know, I didn't know that you worked as a news reporter. I think I, I, I was pretty sure you had like an education and you were, you know, like a a 
contributing part of society when you're, you're when nine eleven <laughs> happened, but I didn't know that, and I didn't mm-hmm. know that you were like the way your job in Vegas came about. I mean, they I thought you were just the girl at the hostess stand at the nightclub, and I kind of thought, how did this girl right. go from like being you know um, about to marry this very successful guy, and I figured you just was like fuck it and like went to Vegas and was just like ripping it every night as a hostess like that's the way it was kind of I think presented you know to the public and I didn't think there was anything wrong with that because I was like of course your life is going to take a different course and of course she's you know having some fun why not so like I find just you know just talking to these last you know 30 minutes and hearing that part of your story is like really fascinating and I'm glad that people are getting to know it because it's definitely not something that people understood at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, I think people have to remember that, that everybody has a story, you know, and, um, there are things that might've happened, happened in their life, but, um, there are things that people will point out that they've read about me or things that those are just a story within my big, bigger life. And there, there are so many interesting things that have happened about, um, to me, uh, that I've done that, um, you know, I want to share with people so that they do get to know me because there are, are so many more interesting things than, um, the things that people have read about me. But it also has been, you know, an interesting thing that in, uh, after the September 11th thing, you know, the media really branded me a victim. And um, people spent a lot of time giving me so much support and love, and I really needed that, and that helped me get through every everything. But I was literally on the cover of every newspaper for years after regarding September 11th. Um, so they, I was branded, really, as the, a victim, the victim. And then 10 years later, I was branded the villain. So wow. four years. So it's been a very interesting thing for me because I've been in the media for a very long time, people forget. And the media has done a lot with my name and flip-flop me a, a lot. And um, very few people have taken the time to um, actually get to know me. And it's made me a person that um, is very sort of, I'm a little bit of a recluse and a little bit closed off because um, you know people do judge me very harshly. and from where I'm sitting, I have to come at each person, one person at a time to get to them so that they know me almost like they have to give me a chance, you know, and that's a a really sort of hard and tiring thing to have to go through life, you know, going one person at a time to get them to, to like you, you know? (laughs) Right. Right. And so, um, okay. So then we'll, we'll just jump to when we got to see you again and we got to know you, on celebrity mm-hmm. rehab. And yeah. so that was a that was pretty shortly after the scandal broke, correct? That they approached you to go on that? Yeah. So I was uh I had come down to Palm Beach and I was a sort of being a recluse in my house. I was having a really hard time. I could not get away from the media. They were camped out front of my house. Um every time I turned on the news, it was all over the place. Tiger was hiding. So of course, everyone wanted to know my every move. It was a very difficult time for me. And Donald Trump called me and said, I want you to be on. I mean, literally, my phone rang and it was Donald Trump. And he said, I want you to be on the next apprentice. And so I agreed. And everyone said, Rachel, this will be a you're so smart. This will be a great chance for everyone to see our businesswoman. You will, you know, you will get a chance to show people your personality where no one's talking about the tiger thing. I said, okay, great idea. I'll do it. So we're like very close to making it happen. And by the way, this is so interesting because the way that so I get this call from him, I fly to New York because I was living in um oh I was down in Palm Beach, but I was living I also had my house in Las Vegas. So I flew to New York to meet of all people, Michael Cohen right. for dinner to seal that deal. His, his former attorney. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Right. Who, by the way, could be very charming and funny. He took me to um, Serafina for dinner. We had pizza and pasta and, and had a great laugh. He was very funny. And, um, you know, that was who he sent to make this deal, which I thought, you know, after all this happened, I, I found it to be very funny. Yeah. So, um, the people whose cell phone numbers I have in my phone are so bizarre, <laughs> but anyway, um, 
So um, anyways, I, I still wasn't feeling right about this decision because I thought, you know, you can be portrayed a lot of different ways. And I knew that on that show, I could be portrayed in a bad way. And the people on the show would probably give me a really hard time. And I wasn't, you know, I was scared to do the show. And in the meantime, I was getting calls from people from celebrity rehab and they were like, we want you on the show. And they kept upping the money. And I said, listen, I don't have an addiction. So I've never, I don't do drugs. I don't drink. I don't, you know, I have wine every once in a while, I, but I'm not a, an, an addict of any sort. So they said, well, you're a love addict. And I said, love addict. That is so dumb. I don't even know what that means. So they were like, listen, will you just fly to LA and come talk to Dr. Drew? And I had seen Dr. Drew on TV, but, and I thought he was just the cutest thing ever. And I was like, well, you know, maybe, but really what got to me is that I was having such a hard time and I was so alone and I was so screwed up by what was going on. I mean, I was all over the news. Everybody hated me. I was so uh, upset about everything that was going on in my life that I decided to take the meeting with Dr. Drew. So Dr. Drew and I sit down, we're at the Lermitage in LA and I look at him and I'm just like, I, I don't know what to do. And he has this conversation with me that had nothing to do with the show. He just talked to me about my life, like a therapist would. And, um, so my father, um, was an addict and my father died of a cocaine overdose when I was 15. Oh, wow. Sorry. And thank you. And so he's like, listen, you, you know, he gave me this whole rundown of things and he's like, you have some issues with men and I can see why, and this is why. And I started sobbing at the table and he's like, I, all he said was, I see you and I am here to help you. And I just was like, I'm in, I'll start tomorrow. And the show was starting that night. And I was like, um, I'm in, let's go. I'll sign up right now. And I just needed that time with Dr. Drew. I needed the help. And I was like, if you need me to say I'm a love addict, if you need me to say I'm a, any addict, doesn't matter. I need the time with you to do this because I am so lost. And let me tell you something about that show. Nothing is scripted. It was the best three weeks of help that I've gotten in a long time. Dr. Drew is amazing. Um, I understand that people are paid to be on the show. The celebrities are paid to be on the show. But I think that that was great because those people who came had real addictions. Like, uh, you know, some of them, one of guy on the show was there for heroin addiction. He, he, I mean, all of everybody had their own problems. But it, whatever the reason it took them to get there, the big reason was money. Some of it, they wanted to be on TV again. They hadn't been on TV for a while, mm -hmm. whatever it was. But most of it was the paycheck, right? Well, paycheck or not, they were clean and sober for those 30 days. And the relationships we made were real. The therapy they got was real. The challenge they got from Dr. Drew and, um, you know, Bob was real. And what they chose to do when they left there was their own problem. And since then, um, you know, one guy that I was on the show with actually died recently. Um, who was that again? Is, I remember that. Um, Jason, um, Davis. Yeah. Just died recently. Um, but I still keep in touch with, um, most of the people on the show. Was it um, your roommate Janice Dickinson? It was. Yeah. How was that? Um, well, I left the show for 24 hours because of Janice. <laughs> I walked out. Um, I knew her before from the clubs, which was weird. I knew a couple of the guys, um, that I went into the show, uh, because of them coming in to Tao and they were my clients. Mm -hmm. So it was like very weird. Um, and also it was very weird cause I wasn't a celebrity, but all this, I was a bigger name than any of those people were right. at the time. So they were trying to get me or Liza Minnelli or the two people to make the show. And the offer was $400,000 to either one of us. So, and, um, now what was the kind of money being offered for apprentice? $25,000. It was, a uh, uh, favored nations or whatever it is. So um, only unless you won the whole shebang. Did yeah. You make but it goes to, 
Yeah, and and then it goes to charity. So my charity, by the way, was Red Cross. Oh, and so Which then, I was so, so happy then, to do. when you said, "All right, I'm ready to go, Doctor Drew tonight," so then did you have to call Michael Cohen and say, "I'm out"? So I did, and next thing I know, I see on TMZ. Donald Trump, I forget what he wrote, some horrible thing like, oh, fuck that girl. Sorry. Oh, yeah. you know, screw that girl. You know, I never wanted her to be on the show anyway or whatever. I don't even know who she is. That's what he said. Rachel, you could tell. I don't even know who that girl is. I mean, typical now what yeah. you see, you know, pretends like he doesn't even know who anybody is. What a jerk. So yeah. anyways, I'm glad I didn't do it because I got I got such great help. I made great friends and I love Dr. Drew. And you well, know, if I called him tomorrow to say, I need your help, he, he would answer the phone, you know? Well, I've been really good friends with Dr. Drew now for quite a few years too. I've actually like stayed at their place in New York. I love his wife, Susan. Oh. They just came to my birthday in Laguna in June. And um, he really is exactly that. And you really yeah. can call him and ask him anything and such a straight shooter and he's never you know it, it's and he's great and they have such a great marriage and family and it's just yeah. um and I remember there was a great connection between you guys and I remember even watching the show people started to have rumors that like oh is Rachel trying to get you know with Dr. Drew or something and I was like oh. and, and you know we I knew that was never the case, but I didn't know oh, him as right. well as I know him now. But like, I look back at that now knowing like how strong their marriage is and, and who Dr. Drew is. And I'm like, you know, that's even kind of upsetting that oh, anyone yeah, even, so... th that anyone ever thought that, you know? Yeah. That's so ridiculous. Now yeah. he's the, w the most wonderful thing about him is that when he looks at you and is talking to you, you're the only person in the room. You know, mm -hmm. and and your problems are his problems. And he really um, he gets you. And um, I uh, I really needed him um, at that time. And he helped me. He helped me get through that crisis. And I thought that um, I didn't have the strength. And it wasn't about the crisis. We, By the way, we never talked about the media being all over me. We never talked about the tiger stuff. We never talked about it all centered back to my father dying. It all centered back to, um, me losing my fiance. Um, they flew their crew to New York city and help and came to ground zero to like, help me say goodbye to Andy. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about, uh, my, my father and my relationship with my father and my last phone call with my father and, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And so, I mean, he just was, the most amazing thing ever. So when people talk about reality TV, um, some of the reality TV you love is scripted, but that reality TV show, I can tell you is not, and it's fascinating and helpful. And I've made a ton, ton of friends out of it. So after, so, so after you get some healing from that, then, mm -hmm. and cause you're a parent now, how shortly did, after that, did you fall in love with your, your daughter's father? Um, well, I, as I did the show, um, I started to go on Facebook and, you know, online dating is such an interesting thing because you can, um, I, social media in general is such an interesting thing. Cause it's all to me, smoke and mirrors. People can be who, whoever they want. Right. Well, anyways, Dr. Drew gave me this advice and he said, um, you know, date someone like this, don't do this anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. So the up and down, this, you mean? This, yeah. Yeah. No. So this guy wrote me on um, Facebook and said, I'd like to take you out on a date. And I looked, you know, I looked at his profile and his family looked very even keel and nice. And he went to Penn State and he was a football player and he was, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he was very cute, very handsome, came from a very good looking family family. They all looked nice and normal. There was no pictures of ex-girlfriends or him, you know, holding beer cans and standing around with girls in bathing suits. You know, he was just, yeah. he, it was a nice guy. It was just family pictures. So I was like, okay. So interestingly enough, Donald Trump had invited me to apologize to his New Year's Eve party um, at Mar-a-Lago. So I flew to Florida to go to the Mar-a-Lago Christmas uh, 
New Year's Eve party, Christmas party, no, New Year's Eve party. And Matt, um, who was living in New York, met me there. And that was our blind date. And we met um, down in Palm Beach. And he was a sweet, nice guy. And we started dating. And we immediately sort of just started dating. And that was that. And um, we, I had bought an apartment at the time. I renovated it. Someone came in and decided to buy it very quickly. So I, again, sort of picked up my stuff and moved to San Francisco. I brought uh, Matt with me and go ahead. No, so I I was going to say, why San Francisco? His company, um, the... I Googled where the sort of hit his company did the best. He's oh. 10 years younger than me. And so okay. I wanted him to have a, a good chance. So it was San Francisco and I didn't care where I moved. I like to sort of move every once in a while. So I, so I got a nice house in San Francisco and I said, we'll go there. You'll get a job there. Sort of helped him get a job there. And he, um, got a job. We moved there. We were, um, recruited to do the amazing race and, and so we started practicing for that and we went to LA to get all the, um, the, um, like the blood tests and the shots, shots yeah. and all, yeah. And all that. And they called me, um, a couple weeks later and they said, we have good news and we have bad news. Um, the bad news is, is you can't do the show anymore. And the good news is, is you're pregnant. And I was that's like, that's how you found out. That's yes. amazing. I was that's like, amazing. the what? amazing race. Amazing news. <laughs> yes. So I was like, what? What are you kidding me? So I took about, I peed on about 10 pregnancy sticks, you know, because I was like, what are you got to be crazy? And I was sobbing because I, I was like, how am I going to tell this 25 year old kid that he's having a baby? Because again, he's 10 years younger than me. I mean, he's a kid, right? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this is horrible. And I really didn't have this in my cards. I didn't think I was, I didn't really want, I don't really, really like other people's kids. I'm not really friendly to kids. I'm always like, oh, do you have parents? They're always throwing up or yelling or pooping or whatever. Yeah. So um, I just was like, no, this is, this doesn't seem right. And I called my best friend and I told her that I was pregnant. And she said, Rachel, do you know what today is? It, and it happened to be September 11th that I found out. And she, and she said, this means, and it was, and, um, uh, and it was, uh, 2011. So it was on the decade anniversary. Oh my God. So, um, she said, Rachel, this means that you're supposed to have this baby because you're getting the news today and you're no longer supposed to think of today as a bad day. You were supposed to think of it as a day as you're starting your new life and you're having, you're going to have a baby and this is the right thing to do. Cause I didn't know if it was. If I should, right. you know, I didn't know what I was. And after she said that, I was like, you're right. Okay. New adventure. You know, I'm always about adventures. Like if, you know, I'm, right. I'm always about adventure. So I said, okay, all right, we're doing this. So poor Matt comes home from work and I set him down on the couch and I basically tell him, I, <laughs> the poor guy, I said, I have some bad news. So, um, we're not doing the amazing race anymore. And he's like, oh, did they not think I was interesting enough? You know, this poor guy. <laughs> so, you know, he just, he's so good looking. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of him. He's so good looking, but just, he's a little quiet. Yeah. Anyways. And I was like, no, that's not why, you know, I'm pregnant. And he was so on board. He was, it couldn't have been a better reaction. Mm -hmm. So it was very sweet. Anyways, long story short, didn't work out with him. So did you marry um, or not? We did marry because my grandmother, who was alive at the time, and I couldn't tell her that I was, um, well, and she stopped speaking to me after the Tiger Woods thing. So then I was <laughs> visiting Vegas, and I've then been also very angry about being um, pregnant and not married. I, I would just send her to her grave. Okay. So. I went to Vegas and I wanted to tell her that I was pregnant. And so I was at someone's wedding in Vegas and they said, oh, you know, you're glowing or whatever. I said, I'm pregnant. And they said, why don't you guys get married? So me, always up for an adventure, said, great idea. <laughs> so 
we went and got uh, we went and got our marriage certificate. We went and got married at the Little White Chapel. It was about eleven fifty five p.m. Um, and we played. That's what you get for waking up in Vegas or whatever it is. As we walked uh-huh. down the aisle, but everyone that went to that wedding came to this wedding. So it was a huge wedding. It was so fun. Uh-huh. And when I got and then that next morning, I could tell my grandmother, Grandma. Just so you know, this is my husband and I'm pregnant. So she started talking to me again, which was fabulous. Okay. She was no longer. Yeah. So <laughs> the whole, it was a whole thing. Um, so that okay. was the story with that. And then, <laughs> and then, so your, your child, your daughter, Wyatt is nine. How old is she? She's eight. She's eight. eight. So, and so what's been happening since you became a mom then? Um, well, I wanted to get out of the spotlight for, you know, everybody likes to associate me with scandalous stuff. So I, um, I came back to New York when she was little, I wanted to have a job. I love working. Um, so I, uh, decided to open up a store. I thought, why couldn't I do it? I didn't really find any stores in New York in where I lived that I liked. So a girlfriend of mine and I literally, found a a broker who um, would go show us different open um, commercial real estate spaces on the Upper West Side. And I'll never forget this one landlord said, well, why don't you come back tomorrow and bring me your business plan? And we're like, yeah, sure, no problem. And we leave and we're like, what the hell is a business plan? Like, we had no idea what we were doing. So we go home, I Google one, I, you know, we fill it out the template or whatever, we come back and this guy believed in us and he knew we were full of shit about the business plan, but he believed in us. He gave us the keys. um, And long story short, we were able to open up this um, store on 73rd and Columbus, which ended up being this gorgeous store that was written up in like People Magazine to like this magazine in France for being like a really gorgeous store. Um, And What did you sell? Um, children's clothes. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh Um, Children's clothes and accessories. Um, and then I ended up having my own like little, a very small little line, um, uh, of my own stuff called Wyatt Lily. But, um, we did it just on a whim and we were like, Oh, we can figure this out. If any, if anyone else can do it, so could we. And, um, it was like a really fun thing. And we won all these awards, best children's store in New York. And, um, you know, Time Out Magazine gave us all these awards. And like, we we just kept winning award after award after award. And we were like, this is, you know, this is so fun. And it just gave me something um, to do every day, to go every day and to feel good about. Um, but I was met with a lot of weird, um, uh, not backlash, but sometimes I would get people that would come in and see my business card and be like, oh, your name looks familiar. Oh, you look familiar. Where do I know you from? And people sort of wouldn't leave me alone about that. And I would be like, oh, no, you don't, you don't know me, you know, or they'd be like, no, no, don't you have the same name as that girl, that awful girl, you know, um, that was, you know, in that scandal, you know, so it would get, it was a little bit, um, there was like this very weird, ironic thing about it that was like uncomfortable, but I was there every day in the store. I would open the store and close the store. I would be there every day. And so, and during that time, so then when did you and your husband decide that you guys were no longer compatible? Um, We decided, um, we broke up when my daughter was about one or one and a half. Um, Oh, so pretty shortly after. Yeah, Yeah. shortly after. You know, he's, again, he's much younger than me and and much younger in sort of uh, age doesn't matter, but it's really sort of life experience. And I've had a lot of life experience, which makes me a lot older, I think. So I, I probably need to end up with somebody older. Um, so I, uh, I, it just didn't work out at the time. And, um, we've had a lot of battles in the meantime, you know, about stuff, but underneath it all, I think he's just growing up and he's a good guy. He's, uh, he loves his daughter and my daughter loves him. So, you know, I guess that's, that's what's important. So I have to, I am right when we were just about to start the interview, I thought, Oh my God. Now you might be like hell to the no, but 
I think you would make an incredible Real Housewife of New York and be friends if they were to get younger girls integrated like Leah. I don't know if you watch it, but have you ever been approached? I can't believe that you've never been approached to be a Real Housewife of New York. Oh, it's funny. Last year they approached me. And they said I, knew I it. they said they that I made it into the last five, but they must have approached me when they were only in the pool of the last five. So maybe they didn't like whoever they had gotten to. So randomly I got a phone call and they did a couple interviews with me and they said that that, you know, I I was in the very sm- short list, you know, but it was right before they started filming. They're like, we're going to start filming in like a month. So be ready if we call, you know, if we want you. Um, but I know some of those girls. I know a lot of these reality stores very, uh, stars very randomly, um, which is funny. Um, so, um, but like, you know, for example, Tinsley, she used to date my assistant and I went out on a, uh, like a blind, not a blind date, but a date when I was married to Matt, she went out when she just started dating my assistant. So, it's very interesting now to see her in the role that she's in because she was just like my assistant's girlfriend at the time. Yeah. And that's like a very odd thing to see where she is now. Right. You know, right. and, uh, and, um, I have known Harry Dubin for a long time. Like we were just in the news, um, a couple times this week. Um, and is that strictly platonic or was it is, ever romantic? Okay, yeah. Let me, no, let me clear the, the air on this whole thing. He, this guy has tried to date me for years. Okay. And I don't want to say that to sound like the, conceited. That, yeah. Be, yeah. Conceited because he's probably tried to date, you know, the coffee table next to you. I mean, right. this guy just, he really loves women. Um, he's a very nice guy. I'm friends with Aviva. Aviva. I know Aviva because our kids go to school together. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah. And Aviva is such a great woman. I love her. I cannot speak more highly about her. I had Um, her on this show a few months ago too. And I I loved talking to her and hearing her story. Yeah. Yeah. She's great. So I think she's great. So I don't like to throw anybody under the bus, but I will say about Harry that, you know, I think that he has some trouble with the truth. I think he has some trouble with trying to stay out of, um, trouble and you know him with the whole Ramona thing and like he he wants to I mean he will make out with anyone and then he'll deny that he did it and then he'll go make out with the wall if you know he has a drinking issue and a truth issue and I couldn't ever date someone like that you know so it's like it's hard and it's even hard to be friends with him sometimes because you can't actually have a conversation with someone who's not based in reality and who also will call page six and be like, by the way, I'm in Palm beach with Rachel. Try to say that we maybe are more than friends when we're not. And then I know that he planted that story, you know? Oh, wow. So we're not, yeah. So we're not speaking right now because, (laughs) you know, I, it just sort of can't, I can't deal with that kind of person that has to call press like that, you know? And so so weird when when you were talking to them, had they said, okay, we would like you to join, were you ready to accept the invitation to join the cast? Yes, I totally would have accepted. However, I felt like my reality is, and I'm not saying this to put, a, put any, put the show down. My reality is like real. Like I at the time, especially I was like in a crisis. I was in the middle of closing my store, deciding whether or not I was taking my daughter out of public uh, private school and putting her in public school. My ex-husband and I were in like a court battle. Like this is reality. You know, I was, um, really going through a lot. And I'm like, if you want to show that and show what it's like to live in New York and be a real person, you know, I'm, I'm a New Yorker. Like I'm, uh, you can definitely show my shit. I'm happy to show it and I will make great TV for you probably, but that's the real stuff. My crisis isn't going to be about like, Oh, some guy didn't show up for a date and my dress doesn't look good on me and I've gained five pounds and whatever. Like I have some real shit going on in my life. So, you know, I don't know if they, if that was like too much for them, you know, like, I mean, you know, you never know what the reasons were, but I, hopefully, you know, I think they're going to come back for you. 
I think they're going to come back. And I think you would be a great addition because I do think, I mean, I love the girls, you know, the classic ones, Luann, Ramona, Sonia. They're hilarious. But I do think, like, you need to integrate, inter, like, introduce some girls that are more like Leah's age, you know, which is you, and get a couple interesting new stories and people in there. I think that, I think you'd be really good. And you're, yeah. you know, so I think that would be, I'd like to see it. Oh, thanks. That would be, <laughs> it would be fun. Um, but yeah, the, the, uh, there's a lot of the same storyline sometimes. So I, I have stopped, uh, I've, I've stopped watching. Um, but you know, again, um, those people are, when the cameras are off, they're sort of different. Like for example, tomorrow night I have, Oh, uh, another great story. We were talking about online dating earlier. I went on a date uh, on Bumble with Mario Singer. How random you, is that? Of a when? person to meet on, on Bumble. I How don't long know, ago? a couple months ago. P.S. He's coming over tomorrow night. I'm making him dinner with my daughter. <laughs> is that juicy or what? <laughs> That's pretty juicy. <laughs> I mean, I think he's really, I think he's very good looking. He's so cute. We're just friends. We're just friends. But the point is, is like y- you, you can meet some good people, by the way, on, on Bumble. <laughs> yeah. On online dating. Also, you know, I dated, I don't know if you know this about me, I dated Brett Boone, who's like a major uh, baseball player. His his brother is now the manager of the Yankees, uh, wow. Aaron Boone. Anyways, doesn't matter, but I met him on Facebook. He just randomly wrote me. Matt Altman, who's on Millionaire Listing, his brother. Oh, of Chicago. course, yes. Met him on Facebook. He wrote me. We dated for a couple months. I mean, you meet a lot of people on social media. This well, that's good. So you're having some fun. I like that yeah. you're having some fun. Wait, did you also date some the guy from the TV show Bones or something? Oh, wait. Oh, that David mixed up? I did. I did. You did? Yeah. That was a little bit scandalous. Yes, I did. But I will. No one's ever asked me about this, which is okay. odd. Um, so this is a, a juicy scoop, I guess. Um, he was married at the time to, I think her name is Jamie. She was pregnant. With, I think, their second child. And he told me that they were separated. And he was living in the guest house in the backyard. And he had given her this, you know, they were on and off. And he had given her this pregnancy. And they decided to keep the pregnancy as, like, their parting, not present, but, you know, that they yeah. decided to have the baby, but they were going to be separated. And I had no reason not to believe him because I spoke to him day and night, night and day, I saw him on every trip. I, I was very, um, I was very close to him. I mean, I met a lot of people in his life, his manager, I would go on trips with him. The way we broke up is when he was in the hospital room and she was giving birth to the baby. And I see something on like people magazine online or TMZ that he's having a baby with his wife and they're still a couple. And you know, he's in the delivery room and they're having the baby. And I'm like, David, why does the media think you guys are having this baby together? And he's like, well, we've got to talk. And I was like, oh, my God, you jerk. So, uh, I mean, I dated I had dated him for like eight or nine months. Wow. Yeah. 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 That's pretty deceptive. Yeah. And then come to find out that he did that a lot with women. So. Wow. Um, yeah. But I was really in. I mean, I was really in love with him. He's a real. Uh, and when, and that was Casanova. before. Was that before your daughter was born? Or after? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, way before. Yeah. Well, Rachel, this has been... Um, oh, wait. And, yes. one, and one thing yeah. I wanted to stop you on, just because what? I thought you would find this interesting. I, um, You never asked me about PK. Oh, yes. There's a photo of you and PK, too. Tell me about PK. Aren't you, like, a huge... Are you a fan of his? Oh, or, and, oh and I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of the whole show. I've had Dorit mm-hmm. on the show. I think Dorit's really grown on me. I think they're extremely fun to watch I've never had like dinner or like hung out I'm not like you know on a texting relationship but I I find (laughs) I find their story to be intriguing so what's the story so I'll give you the scoop on PK really quickly because I'm sure you have to go okay PK um was one of my clients when I uh worked in the nightclub business and he started out as 
uh, just being a client that would come in and he would uh, come in and spend a little bit of money. Long story short after, and he would hit on me all the time and we became very close friends for a year. We were just friends and he would spend a little more money and a little more money. And long story short, he cultivated himself into the man who became the first guy that spent $250,000 in one night at Tao nightclub. Which um, one? Which, which, which Tau. location? No, oh, sorry. In Las, in Las Vegas. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he was the very first guy to spend that kind of money. It was unheard of at the time. And he was my customer. And so everyone, um, thought that that was like the most incredible thing they've ever heard of that this customer would do that. He was buying bottles for every table. There was a, you know, a go-go dancing night and he became the judge and he was, you know, handing out hundreds to everybody. It was so fun, but you know, I became his wingman, you know, and I would, you know, kind of hang out with him in Vegas and New York, wherever he would go. And I became friends with all his friends and I never was interested in him at all for a year. And then something changed and PK really grows on you where <laughs> I just fell in love with him. Really? Fell in love with him. And we started dating for like a couple months, uh, a couple months. And this was at the point where he was getting a divorce from Loretta, his wife, or he said he was, you know, that they were in the process of getting divorced and he was moving. And he kept saying he was going to leave her, but he hadn't yet. And, um, and I was like, well, I can't date a married man. You know, I was, yo- I was young at the time. I was like, I can't date a married man. And she lived in London and they, he was always here. So he was like, no, it's over. I'm moving to New York and it's over. It's over. But I think he was, he really loved his family. I mean, I don't, I don't watch his show, but I never hear him talk about Loretta and the kids. He has three kids. Well, um, I mean, I think I think she has mentioned she she mentioned it on my interview that one daughter okay. is now living, I think, in L.A. and pursuing like fashion. And I think he I think that is true of him. I just don't think they feature it. OK, so, yeah, he was obsessed with these kids and loved them more than anything. Like I'm I'm almost shocked that he has a wife and two kids because whatever his problems were with Loretta, his kids were like the most important thing. And the reason why we didn't work out is that he was having such a hard time really divorcing London, Loretta, the kids, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like he couldn't wrap his head around really leaving all of that, um, because of the kids. And, um, Loretta is such a different person from Dorit. She's very bohemian and just a totally different vibe, you know? So it's just very interesting um, because the two are so different. Right. Anyway, the other thing about PK is people make fun of um, Dorit or whatever her name is because of her accent. I will say anytime I was out around PK, all I would do is talk like PK and have an accent <laughs> and be like, PK, PK, what are we doing today, PK? That I spoke like that the entire time I was with him. Like you <laughs> develop an accent. Because you cannot, you cannot not speak like that when you're with PK. I mean, you just can't, you cannot help yourself. He has the most incredible accent. You can, you, you just, if you're around him, you will speak like that. It's weird. So do so did you end on a nice note then or? Um, we, I'm trying to remember, uh, cause it was so long ago. I mean, we did and we didn't. I mean, there was some things he, listen, he was very generous to me, um, he was always a very generous guy. I have him saved in my phone as my catcher. He um, would always catch me before I would hit the ground. Like he would always be um, the person that sort of saved me from things, almost like a, a dad figure mm-hmm. later on. You know, he he was a good guy to me and he really was caring. Um, but he became more like that instead of more of a boyfriend, you know? Yeah. Um, and he really started to spin out of control with, um, you know, I think he was having more problems at home, figuring out his life. He was losing a lot of money. He was spending so much money, 250000 here, 80000 in New York. On my own birthday, he spent $80,000 at 10 June in New York City just to celebrate my birthday and then sent me on some 
$50,000 trip or something to Thailand. You know, I mean, the guy was just spending money like nobody's business. And then I think filed for bankruptcy. I mean, you know, um, but I think he was really out of his mind at the time, but he has some incredible friends around him who they never feature. I don't know if he's still friends with them. He's an incredible guy. Um, but he's very insecure and very sensitive. And, um, I'm surprised about a lot that I see about him Mm -hmm. um, and a lot said about him. Do you know what I mean? But he's not, he, he, he has a great personality, but he's not some big shot, you know, money guy. He he's anymore, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, but he, but he's a great, great guy and a fun, a a fun, very fun, intoxicating personality to be around, but it ends. It's like, it's like a flame that goes out. Do you watch Beverly Hills? Because I mean, no, if my I've ex never was seen on, it. see, if I was on, my ex was on a show, I'd be watching it just out of curiosity. No, I've never seen it. I really? see little, I've seen little bits because I okay. like the girls on it. Um, I like the girls on it, but I don't like to see, I don't like to watch him. Uh uh-uh. uh. It, it's hard for me to watch my yeah. ex on things. Actually. Okay. So like I'll watch when the girls are on. I love all the girls on it. I like Dorit. I think she's very pretty. I think she's, I mean, whatever. I don't know. I'm confused by the whole, all the interaction about what's going on and the lesbian thing and the. Oh, right. Yeah. And I get confused by all that stuff. So. um, Yeah. That's the story right now. But actually Dorit's come off like very nice and normal. It's not, she wasn't really an instigator of it. And she's kind of actually being like really fair and, um, yeah, I think Dorit is grown on a lot of people because I think when people first started to see it, it was so much about the glam and they and they never showed her with her kids. I and mean, I talked about her with it, you know, the way things they edit things. Um, so it was always like she's getting her hair finished and she's like, is that my baby Chaga? And then she'd leave. <laughs> and so it's like later on, she was like, I'm happy now that they actually show like how much I really do spend with my kids because I really do. And I'm really like actively involved and and, you know, and that's. That's the downfall of reality TV, especially when you're a really devoted mom and then you see it portrayed as if you, you know, barely touched your children, right. you know, in a week. <laughs> so it's like right. I, I so I thought I kind of empathized with her on that one that I was like, oh, that is kind right. of shitty. Um, yeah. But, you know, she's fun to watch. Like, you know, she's super high fashion. And I think that's enjoyable to see at home. You want to see, yeah. you know, she fits that. Everybody fits something different, you know. Yeah. And um, so that's why, I, yeah, I'm intrigued. I love the shows, so that's to me, it's completely entertaining. And I'm, I think they choose really interesting people, and that's why I like interviewing those yeah. type of characters too. You know, I, I, because I, they always have a juicy, interesting story, as do you, that nobody knows about. You know, and so right. that's why I like interviewing people like you and. Um, you know, and the the incredible guests I've had on the show. Well, Rachel, you just freaking brought it. So juicy, so (laughs) fun, and so interesting and poignant. And, you know, and um, I'm really excited to, you know, see what else comes for you and watch the documentary. And I think that's so true about what you said about the females that are in these scandals and how it is very sexist and biased, you know, in, in what happens and how you root for the man and, oh, has he come back from this? And the woman is per- perceived, you know, in a completely different way, whether it's you, Monica Lewinsky, whatever. I've always right. felt that way. And so um, I was glad to get, like, your story out there. So thank, thank you. you. I really do appreciate it. Well, you guys, tell me what you thought of that one. Uh, Great shows coming up. Great interviews coming up, of course. You can always get more content on patreon.com slash juicy scoop. Watch my special. Tell everybody. Leave a review. Also, leave a review for this podcast if you haven't already. I really appreciate it, and it really helps keep me at the top of the charts. Thank you.